Hey guys, uh, I felt like talking, but I didn't really feel like going in front of the camera tonight. So I apologize if you guys are used to seeing my, my face. But uh, I wanted to talk about what's going on with the Amber Heard case. And I want to talk about my own personal history regarding this kind of behavior. So for the past few weeks, the Amber Heard case has sort of been in front of everyone talking about what Cluster B is, uh, what it tends to do to people, and, and specifically what Johnny Depp had gone through in his relationship um, in the form of abuse and manipulation. But what often isn't talked about, is, it's, or what I should say is what often is skipped is, is the lead up to these situations and how people find themselves in these situations. And for the most part, uh, the questions that usually get raised are, how do people ever find themselves in these situations? Why don't they ever leave? And I want you to put you into the mindset of how these relationships start off. So for the most part, the one common trait that these types of relationships tend to have is they tend to have uh, a really strong beginning. So I want you to imagine what your perfect spouse looks like, physically looking, um, emotionally supportive, um, tends to like your hobbies, tends to like your activities, tend to be very supportive. Um, I want you to imagine the perfect person, at least in the perspective of what you would consider to be the perfect person in a relationship. And this is what is really interesting about these kinds of scenarios, because when you enter these relationships, you don't enter them with there being any elements of toxicity. In fact, quite the opposite. You enter these relationships believing that these people are your soulmate. And it's a slow progression into what it eventually becomes. But for the first few months, what you're dealing with is you're dealing with a constant high. You're dealing with someone that can't get enough of you. You're dealing with someone that's putting high praise for you. You're dealing with someone who's stroking your ego on a daily basis. You're dealing with someone who gets every part of you and gets what you need in order to be the most productive and to feel like a million dollars each and every day. You often read about what it's like to be in love and you, you think in the back of your mind, yes, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. Yes, this is what I want to keep. And it's a constant high. And the image that's burned into your mind during this initial phase of the relationship is so addictive, it's so poked, that you would do anything and everything to keep it in your life. But then what ends up happening is slowly, and it's almost so slow that you don't see it coming, but slowly you start seeing cracks in the mask of this person. You start realizing that they're maybe not as truthful as they come across. They're maybe not as... Um, authentic as they initially came across. And then you start noticing little by little, small little red flags, nothing that would consider be considered a major eject button scenario, but enough to draw attention. So maybe they have issues with keeping their finances in order. Maybe they have issues with having very toxic people in their past. Maybe there is an issue where you caught them in a little lie. They claim to be in one place and were actually in another. Um, you found yourself lying on behalf of this person as a favor, something that you wouldn't normally do under the normal circumstances that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But the image I'm trying to paint here is that the change from infatuation to toxicity isn't an instant one. In fact, it's it's one that takes many months of slow, gradual uh, mutation. And during this whole phase, you find yourself on the receiving end of criticism. Now, this criticism might start off small. It might start off in the sense of, I don't like how you wake me up in the mornings. I don't like you wearing that shirt. I don't like how you speak to me in that tone or you're being overly aggressive. And you yourself might look at the situation and think, I don't think I'm being overly aggressive. I don't believe that I am being a negative person here or an overly critical person. So you had entered this relationship believing that this person had the best intentions for you. So, so you accommodate their behavior because you 
you want them to be happy because this is your soulmate. This is someone who inherently represents everything you've ever wanted in a partner. So you make these small adjustments, but slowly these adjustments become more and more consistent and bigger and bigger in, in the sheer amount of compromise they have to take. So before you know it, a compromise of you being less critical turns into you being critical of everyone else. Uh, a compromise of you spending some time with them or more time with your partner becomes you spending all of your time with your partner. And any time that's spent outside of the relationship is a betrayal of the relationship that you're looking to build. And you start getting these little chips in the armor of this perfect, this perfect person that you came across. You start seeing the insecurity. You start seeing the manipulative and sociopathic behavior. But in your mind... You believe that this is a good person. You want this person to return to the form that they were at the beginning of the relationship. And that's inherently the problem. You're seeking to get this person to re return to something that they never actually were. And that's the hardest part because this transition is so gradual that it could have been for the first two years of the relationship, this person was absolutely perfect. It could have been for the first 10 years of the relationship, this person was absolutely perfect. But the moment that you stood up for yourself, the moment that you said, no, I, I'm not going to accommodate you in this request because this is violating a boundary, is the moment that you start getting vilified. It's the moment that you start, or at the very least, they start to look for your replacement. And... Because they're so good at the manipulation aspect of things, they will convince you that their negative action, that their malicious action is not malicious at all and that you're overreacting. So if you catch them cheating or you suspect them of cheating, their immediate response is clearly there's something wrong with you. you you're paranoid. You're crazy. You're being overreactive. This is what I'm talking about. This is the type of instability that I've been so weary about. And of course, your reaction to their toxic behavior becomes the, the front and center subject rather than the actions that led up to it in the first place. They take no responsibility for for the negative consequences they've created. And this is the cycle, this is the history that usually follows in their past. They're usually the victim, the victim of a series of negative circumstances, the victim of a constant barrage of people that never quite understand them, of people that have betrayed them, of people that continue to manipulate them and continue to push them to the brink. And somehow you're supposed to be the saving grace that's here to get them out of the situation that's here to inherently save them. And yet, in the midst of all of this chaos, there is never any personal responsibility. Now, it's not to say that people aren't victims. Like, we, we all are victims in a certain sense. We, we all are victims of our circumstances. We've all had to deal with negative situations. But it's up to each and every one of us to to build our character and to build up a sustainable and a salvageable life. It's no one else's responsibility to, to save us from our own actions. And yet, here we're dealing with an individual who, who lacks that responsibility, who projects all of the blame onto you. And that inherently is the problem. Because you care about this person so much, because you want what's best for them, you're dealing with a situation that is completely unsustainable. And what will happen is you will have a series of hot and cold behaviors. So there'll be days where they'll be really critical and really negative, and you will do your best to maintain a level of control and you will be pushed to the brink. And these arguments that become circular in nature, you'll argue for hours regarding the one person you said hello to on the street that made her jealous. And you know, you'll finally get her on her side and then she'll go back to the initial point and start talking about the situation and how it made her feel. And these arguments don't last minutes, they last hours, three or four hours, five or six hours, arguing the same points over and over and over until you have completely mentally exhausted every ounce of energy that you potentially have left and you give up your free will, you give up the individuality that is you in this relationship to accommodate this other person. You do this 
A, because you care about the person, but B, because you're just tired of the spiraling, you're just tired of the constant nagging, you're tired of the consistent gaslighting that you're being subjected to. You might not even be consciously aware of it, but sure, in the back of your mind, you know that this, this isn't right. Something about this doesn't feel right. But you're so infatuated with the emotions that you feel, with the rush, the high that you feel once the remediation happens, once the rekindle ship happens, that you know, the sex becomes amazing, the, the love becomes addictive. And this is what the key is. It literally becomes a drug. It literally becomes a drug that consumes your life and consumes every aspect of you. You are addicted to this person because of the negative traits that they portray you. You are addicted to the recovery. You're addicted to the abuse. And this is where things get really complicated. In order to become unaddicted to this toxic behavior, you essentially have to be discarded. You have to be replaced by this person because this is a person that by design, by the very definition of who they are, is a parasite. They cannot function alone. They refuse to function alone. They can't. So they need a constant supply, whether that's financial supply, narcissistic supply, emotional supply, love supply. It doesn't matter. This is a being that requires that consistent action. This is why. You're discarded. You're discarded after a new source is found because they need to justify to themselves that you're the actual problem in the situation. And the way that they justify it is they see how weak you are when they finally leave you and they convince themselves, I am leaving this person because they are weak and they're not sufficient for me. And it's a deflection of looking at themselves and seeing the series of consistent and repetitive relationships that always start and always end the same way. They start hot and heavy, things get really aggressive, boundaries are violated, shelters are brought down, and eventually this person stands up to them and they're replaced. And this is the constant theme. For someone that's gone through this personally, I never imagined that I would be in an abusive relationship myself. I always imagined myself as being a, a dominant figure, a dominant person, a really proactive person. I, I have a high, relative high level of success in my career, in my social life, in my YouTube channel. But somehow I ended up in a position where I felt less valued than, than dirt. I felt like I, I brought nothing. And looking back on it, I understand what led up to it. I understand why it happened. And it's only because of that experience that I know to be mentally prepared for it so it doesn't happen again. But there are many people out there who find themselves in these relationships and they usually find themselves in these relationships because there, there's a lack of security, there's a lack of self-confidence that pushes them to find the perfect partner because they want to be saved. I wanted to be saved. Inherently, I kind of was through the discard because the discard showed me what my value was. It showed me what I had to go through in order to become successful. But it also showed me a very dark side of, of my psyche, a very dark side of myself, and a very dark side of humanity. It showed me that there are people out there who will hurt you if given the chance and the opportunity. It showed me that relationships aren't always misunderstandings. Sometimes. There are people out there who will take advantage of you and who will wreck you. And it's not to say that this is everyone. It's not to say that every relationship you have, you, you can inherently blame someone. But it's to say that there are people out there who, who don't care about how they leave you and what your situation is and for us that that tend to fall for these type of people it's it's inherently um demoralizing to believe that someone that you love would discard you so quickly but it's also a case where someone in my position someone who grew up in chaos someone who grew up without um emotional support 
um, I, I tend to seek that emotional support. I tend to seek that validation. And the type of person that tends to attract is, is of the manipulative type. So I have to be inherently careful with the people I, I date when, when I was dating. Um, I have to be careful with the people I let into my life. I have to be self-aware of what I'm going to naturally be attracted to. I'm going to naturally be attracted to the emotional neglect. I'm going to be naturally attracted to the instability and, and the chaos. And it's important for me to, to take that self-reflection and to take this experience and to move forward with the situation. There are many things I, I've never talked about in that relationship. One of them being that I was accused of being abusive myself. And I lost many friends as a result of this relationship. Um, many of those friends came on later on in my life and apologized for, for believing my ex, but the damage had already been done. And as men, um, not to say that women don't go through this kind of abuse as well, women do, but as men, there's a very large gap in, in the emotional support that, that we have readily available. I am of, of the belief that the high suicide rates in men in large portion have to do with emotional abuse. Not always, but a large portion of them do have to do with emotional abuse. And the lack of support that men feel in these kind of situations is, is absolutely isolating. I, I found my own family turning their back on me in these types of situations and telling me to man up and telling me to get over it. And looking back on it, there was very little support that I could actually find. And it was only because of one evening where I called, uh, I ended up calling a suicide hotline just to talk about how depressed I was. And I started explaining this person and my relationship to this person. And this person stopped me and said, look, you're, you're dealing with a sociopath. You're, you're dealing with a narcissist. And that got me down the journey of, you know, reading Psychopath Free and going down this, this journey of self-discovery that eventually merged into this channel. And then Ever since this channel, we've merged into other realms such as, you know, um, attachment styles, relationship dynamics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But oftentimes the people that find themselves on my channel find themselves on my channel because they're going through a really toxic breakup. And what a lot of them don't realize is that they're going through a toxic breakup because they're dealing with someone who is completely not um, negotiable. They, they don't have the best intentions in mind. And, I don't want to scare people with this video. I don't want to, people to um, inherently blame their ex um, because that's not good either. But I do want people to be aware that, look, this kind of person exists. And whether you call it a cluster B personality disorder or whether you call it narcissism or psychopathy, it really doesn't matter. Toxic is toxic. And we need to be aware that this is... A reality in our society and I, I'm all for um, you know not putting labels on people and not diagnosing people I, I think that we as as average people um, should do our best to not try to put labels on things but I also think it's important for us to educate ourselves in the ability to defend ourselves against this kind of person this kind of reaction because you are going to be dealing with people like this in your life one way or another and if you aren't aware of this kind of person existing and you're not aware of what this kind of person is capable of, um, you're in for a relatively big shock. Um, it's my hope that this trial does shed light and bring exposure to this kind of person because uh, far too long we, we have lived in a, in a society that, that dismisses crazy behavior as being, you know, normal and i don't think that we need to be going down that path anymore i think that we really need to draw a line in the sand to tell people look this kind of manipulative and psycho psychopathic behavior cannot and should not be tolerated for our own sake more than anything else and if any of you are in that kind of situation where you're you feel isolated and you feel alone um, I'm going to repeat the words that I wish I had heard when I was going through my breakup and my discouragement, and that's, you're not crazy. This person has completely destroyed any ounce of confidence that you had, and the reason that you were targeted is because you are so giving and are so caring about them. But understand that this person is not good. 
understand that this person is essentially raping your psyche and understand that this person doesn't want what's best for you and quite frankly it's in their interest to make sure that you are absolutely destroyed because that gives them the vow of confidence to move forward ahead without believing there's a problem the fact that you're here on this channel doing the research tells me that you're not this kind of person that you're not a negative person that you're not manipulative that you're you aren't evil because if you ask the question, am I evil, am I a narcissist, am I a psychopath, that inherently is an empathetic response that's you looking at your situation and measuring your actions and seeing that your actions have consequence. So if you are in this situation, you have my deepest sympathies, you have my support. There's tons of videos I talk about on this topic and we also have the Discord. But know that you're not alone. And the more time that you spend going down this rabbit hole, the more painful it will be, but the more liberating it will be as well, because you'll start realizing why you're so attracted to this kind of person in the first place. And if you can learn from this experience, and if you can heal from the past trauma that caused you to become attracted to this kind of person in the first place, you will be in a position where you will be 10 times better than you were when you started this relationship. And I, I noticed that, that changed instantaneously once I decided to move forward and once I decided to heal. Um, the credentials and the criteria of the people I dated just became so much higher after that relationship. My confidence level became so much higher. My career ambitions became so much higher. My fear factor went down. All of it was a direct attribute to the discard. So in many aspects, my narcissistic ex helped me in becoming a much better person. But she didn't do it intentionally. And this is the key factor, and this is where the big F you shows up in, in the face of a narcissist. They seek to destroy you because it's their only validation. It's the only validation that they have to truly look at themselves and not blame themselves. They rather blame you, and if you take yourself out of the equation, they can always blame you for that situation. They can always mock you and criticize and say, oh, well, he, he or she was weak anyways. Or you can become a better version of yourself. You can be educated on what they are. And when they see you being a success and they see you moving on, they're going to try to enter your life again. They're going to try to reintegrate themselves into the success that you've created. But hopefully, if you've done the work and you've done the education, or you've educated yourself, you know fully well what kind of person this is. And you know right then and there, no, I'm not going to let you into my life. You're not going to join me in my success and my hard work. And I'm going to find someone who's worthy of my love, who's worthy of my time, and most importantly, who respects my boundaries. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I would ask that you hit the thumbs up icon below. Those of you who haven't subscribed, I would highly recommend that you do. And of course, if you're interested in joining our Discord, feel free to click in the link in the description below. With that said, this is Fletch, signing off.